I'm going to start recording. Okay, so welcome to book club. We've done the um, the prayer. We've done a land acknowledgement. So I'm really honored that you would all uh, join us here today. Uh, finally turned off my phone. It's been very much busy. So let's get started today. Um, so for those who are new, or maybe it's been a long time since you've been here, I welcome you to the book club. This book club was originally started with 12 Community Safety Initiative, a nonprofit here in the greater Forest Lawn area. And we started it in uh, the Forest Lawn Library. We had a tech that changed it from every second uh, Monday to every third Monday, which I have found is on almost every long weekend ever. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it got put into the magazines that way. So that's, that's the way I guess it's going. And then when COVID-19 happened, we were finally able to start recording these on my uh, podcast and, uh, and we put that out there now. So really honored that you could all be here. Um, my name is Michelle Robinson. My uh, spirit name is Red Thunder Woman, or um, when I say Naganago Meko Chase Chase Komaki, my name is Red Thunder Woman in Blackfoot, and I'm grateful to uh, Red Crane for teaching me how to say that in Blackfoot. And today we are well. I should probably give some rules. Let's let's start off with some ground rules and some the the bigger concept of it is to create a safer space for this conversation, uh, because these are hard conversations to have. Indigenous uh, Canadian settler relationships. Um, you know, these are unfortunately new territory to be working together. So um, I'm going to start by saying that there's there's a few different things that we've gone by. So 12 CSI had the um, accountable space uh, guidelines that I had handed out to folks and it was to realize your privilege and be aware of the po potential power dynamics that may exist within this space. Um, we want to share, uh, we want to give everybody time to talk, but we want folks to be mindful of not talking too much or for too long because everybody wants to have a moment. So if you're non-Indigenous and you've taken 20 minutes of a two hour, um, you know, book club, that that uh, is disrespectful to everybody else. So avoid making assumptions about other people. Be open to critical self-reflection. If an individual tells you that something you said is harmful, try to listen. Uh, understand that we're all in a place of learning. If you said something problematic, apologize, listen to others, and learn and adjust your behavior. Speak for yourself. Use I language. Don't speak for others. Don't share somebody else's stories or experiences. Notice your own biases and ju judgments. Take care of yourself. Think of someone you uh, trust that you can debrief with and plan to contact them. It's okay to leave the room at any time. Um, another point that I like to make is that I allow Indigenous the opportunity to hold space as a priority. So we could have 300 people in this room, but if there's four Indigenous people, then basically 260 or 296 people get to listen. And uh, I, I try to prioritize that voice first because settlers have always had the voice and the floor. So that's where we're coming from when it comes to you know, accountable space guidelines for this conversation. Because the idea is that we wanna learn from each other and not just hear the old school settler narrative that is pervasive everywhere and oppressive to indigenous people. So with that, let's get started. Um, so this book club for this particular session is 21 things that you might not know about the Indian Act, although I've been getting very comfortable saying 21 things that you might hate about the Indian Act. <laughs> Maybe what we'll do is we'll start with a, a circle check-in. Um, so I've done a lot of speaking. Maybe we'll start with Ray and Rosemary, and uh, then I'll, I'll call out uh, folks as we go, because what I find is that I can say it, but then somebody will come or leave, and then uh, all the squares change on me. So let's just start with Ray and, and Rosemary, and then I'll, I'll uh, call out other people. You want me to call? Yes. By the way, this is Don, Don Ray. Don Ray. I, I don't know why yes. I keep saying Ray. I'm so sorry, Don. That, that's, a, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Before I met him, I actually sent him a piece of mail based on the list. And I'm going, what kind of name is this? Don Ray, <laughs> Ray Don. And I sent it to Ray Don. 
Anyway, we laughed about it later. That's right. <laughs> um, my name is my name is Rosemary. Uh, I'm a settler of uh, European American Canadian descent. Um, several many many generations in some cases on this continent, and yeah, I'm a community activist and sometimes artist. Yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm Don, uh, and. Um, I've been enjoying this book club for quite some time. Um, I found this particular book uh, very hard to read because I kept on getting so angry. Uh, so I could read a few pages and then I'd have to stop. And Rosemary would wonder why I was sort of up and down, up and down, up and down. <laughs> but we'll talk more about that later. Awesome. Thank you both. I renamed you to Don and Rosemary. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't know why I kept saying Ray. I'm so sorry, Don. Um, Jacqueline. Hello, I'm Jacqueline. I'm a settler of European Canadian descent and I um, am an artist, a theater artist. And uh, <laughs> This is my second book club and the first one was so great. So I've been looking forward to it all month. Oh, that's great. Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Uh, Julie or Kasha. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Kasha and it's my traditional Teltan name. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm just, I'm happy to be here. It's our supper time and uh, I'm feeling as though I'm not quite settled. However, I can understand um, the, what the previous person said because I had a hard time reading this book, even though I know about most of what's in there. So I went and I purchased the, the audio and I listened to it all day yesterday. And that forced me to move ahead. <laughs> with it. So I'm just really excited about being here and um, thank you for letting me really truthfully uh, join because I, I picked this up from uh, Twitter. That's how I found out about this. <laughs> well, welcome. So, Julie. <laughs> no, well, I'm, I'm grateful. I, you would be shocked to how many times I give out uh, this information, but nobody comes. So I'm <laughs> grateful you came. Thank you, Julie. I do. Yep. Oh, and by the way, Julie, by default, because you identified as Indigenous, you will get the floor first on a regular basis. Wow. Yeah, because, I, I mean, do we need another settler point of view? No, no, we don't. So, Kat, do you want to go next? Speaking of settler points of view, <laughs> hi, I'm Kat. I am a settler of... Uh, European descent as well. Um, I've been part of this book club, gratefully for over a year now and have started my own book club at the same time, also called Settlers Book Club, to um, educate not just white folk, but mostly white folk about what white people are doing. And um, I'm grateful um, to meet all of you and learn from all of you as well. And I'm an artist, too. Awesome. Thank you, Kat. Uh, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I've done some co-organizing with Michelle, which is how I found my way to this book club. And uh, a settler um, and new Canadian, um, American, European, and we moved up to Canada, to Alberta, um, I think eight years ago. Um, and now I'm a Canadian citizen. So yeah, super. I love this book club. I've learned so much here. So thank you, everyone. So grateful all of you come. Crystal. Uh, hi, everyone. Or Oki Nataniko Crystal. I hope I might have said it correctly. Sounds pretty um, good to me. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Um, so I'm also a settler. I like to say settler colonizer because my family came they were really colonizers when they first came. And then I also have more immigrant family. That was more like what I think of as settler. Uh, I'm a teacher and uh, I started 
maybe three years ago when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was kind of coming out and being more in the public, I thought I should learn about this. And at the time I thought I'll just, you know, learn like maybe a year or something and I'll catch up on everything and then I'll know everything. And that obviously was a very big misconception. And so um, I just keep coming back because there's so much more to know and I really appreciate the perspectives. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Bertie. Hi, my, my name's Roberta. Um, I identify as settler. Um, uh, I did learn when I was around 40 that my grandmother was Métis, but I didn't know her. She died when I, my mom was a child. Um, I was coming to this book club for quite a while and uh, then my mom became very ill and died um, not too long ago, so I, I needed a hiatus. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I haven't read the book, so I'm, I'm here to listen and learn. So thank you. Well, I'm grateful that you're here. Uh, Kathy Ong, would you like to chime in? <laughs> that was good, Michelle. Um, Michelle, that, that's chime in is my legal Chinese name. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kathy. I um, met Michelle through political affiliations. Um, I'm from Toronto. I moved to Calgary three years ago. Uh, this is going to be the start of my fourth year. Um, and growing up in a big city, I, I'm a Canadian born Chinese. My parents were um, skilled immigrants that came to immigrated into Montreal in about the 80s. Um, I am really new and I'll say ignorant to Indigenous issues um, because growing up in a large city like Toronto and uh, it's not apparent, I don't see Indigenous people living in the community unless you go outside of Toronto. So um, coming here was a big learning for me. Um, I'm saying to Michelle, she knows I find this intimidating, um, but it's been a great learning. I'm starting with the U of A Indigenous course. I also haven't read the book Birdie, so thank you for saying that. So I, I'm here to listen and learn too. Thank you, Michelle. No, I'm honored you come and I, I want everyone to meet Kathy. Kathy was actually the one who gave me my copy of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Inquiry Report because even though I testified, even though I'm part of the community, even though I had submitted a request for a copy, I did not receive one and Kathy did and passed it off to me. So it wasn't for Kathy, I, I, would, I would not have a copy of that. So really, she, <laughs> she really um, undersold herself on how she's trying to learn and trying to be a great ally. And uh, so I have a lot of respect for her. And, you know, from the political affiliations, we've had very aware of the racism that I'm experienced, she's experiencing, and it's important to have each other to talk and decompress when we have those moments, right? So. Um, yeah, so she's totally underselling herself on how significant she is at trying to be a good ally, just as I'm sure everybody here does. So I just want everyone to know how grateful I am you're here, even if you didn't read the book, because I know we will lead the conversation into two hours and wish we had more time. So grateful you're all here. And Heather, great. I'm glad you made it. So uh, why don't you introduce yourself? You're muted. I'm going to see if I can unmute you. There you go. All right. Okay, it's been quite a week of uh, crashing equipment everywhere, so an inability to access, and this is the best access I've gotten yet, so good luck on that. My name is Heather. I'm a Calgarian. Um, I go by she, her. I'm settler heritage, possibly seven generations on uh, Turtle Island, and um, I'm sorry, I didn't read the book. I couldn't get a library copy. That's okay. I um. Again, I think the discussion is the most important part from folks who have read it. So you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not and I mean, there's lots to discuss even if we didn't have a, a book to read. So <laughs> let's get started with a book, though. Um, so maybe we'll start with Don and Rosemary. Um, or no, let's start with Julie. Julie. Um, why don't you talk about this book? Uh, you joined us on Twitter, which was like, 
I can't believe how quickly you got this book. I obviously don't want to speak for you though. So uh, why don't you tell us what you thought of this book? Um, maybe some things that you learned and you know, you have the floor for as long as you want. I'm totally not used to this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm also an educator. I, I, I teach at uh, our local college and I, I developed an online um, First Nation Studies course and <clears throat> today one of my students wrote a, a journal and it's just really relates to um, um, Bob Joseph's book uh, which I had been putting off reading and I get a lot of um, ideas for PD events or um, yeah I guess PD events and things on, off of Twitter there's like just so much for me to do um, <clears throat> and I've been thinking myself lately how when I do go to meetings that, that it is monopolized by certain people <laughs> And I was just also thinking about, um, you know, how can we stop that or just, because I, I really like it when everybody gets to share like a round table. I, I do enjoy that. And I also enjoy it when people don't cut me off because I do, I'm a pauser and that really kind of pisses me off. But um, nevertheless, I'm a professional. <laughs> um, and, you know, pick my, my battles, but nevertheless, um, it was just really hard for me to get through uh, because when I read something like this, I, I want to stop and think about it. And I also could really relate it to my own life and, and where I come from. And that's the story that I'm, I'm still c trying to piece together uh, because I, I also pass as settler and I, I am, I'm just a little bit over what my elder in town here calls um, half smoked. <laughs> uh, so when I look at, and these are just 21 things, and I really like what you'd said um, about how there are several things you might hate about the Indian Act. Well, those are the 21. And there was a time not that long ago when I didn't know about any of this um, because I was brought up to be. Uh, Canadian, um, we were, I would say, very well um, assimilated. But nevertheless, uh, I, I just got my name, Kasha, probably about 10, maybe 12 years ago from my grandma. And um, just recently, I decided, because I started up an a, um, Indigenous educator uh, half-time job at work, that I was going to go by Kasha. And I do do that. Um, and so I think part of it is, and from reading this especially, it just reminds me that, um, that it's okay to be me and to express um, my, I was gonna say ingenuity, but I mean, even that's a different way for me to express myself. Um, But we have um, in the uh, Teltan First Nation, uh, I am a member of the Teltan Band. And there are, there's, yeah, there's just so much with that. And I live here on Lahaine, which is the um, uh, Gots and the Nala Tribes of Simshan Nation. And um, so there's a lot of different bands out there, but not everybody understands where the uh, bands come from and, and what they're you know, like the, what their responsibilities are. And I won't go into too much detail other than <clears throat> Bob has done a great job of summarizing what that is. And depending on what it is I'm talking about, you can't get me to shut up, but <laughs> I'm going to um, just also listen and learn from um, everyone here today. So Madhu, and thanks for letting me share. <clears throat> now I'm unmuted. Okay, folks. Um, well, I'm grateful to to hear your uh, what you had to say about it. Um, so I don't think I introduced myself uh, fully. I'm was born here in Calgary, so I identify as a native Calgarian. 
And whenever anybody else calls themselves Native Calgarian, I say, oh, what nation are you from? <laughs> and uh, the reason why, and so I'm trying to take that terminology back, you know, Native Calgarian. I don't like it when non-natives use it. So, but my mom is actually from Yellowknife and uh, her grandparents are both from uh, Treaty 11, uh, Good Fort Hope. So that's what makes us Satu Dene. So I'm Satu Dene. And um, even though I was born here in Calgary, I still see myself as um, a visitor to this area. Uh, even though I've been here most of my life, I still see myself that way because I recognize I'm in Blackfoot territory. Um, like yourself, um, Kasha, I, I um, was raised settler. I was raised white. I didn't think of uh, the ramifications of the Indian Act. Uh, so just to give folks a bit of my story, when I was first born, uh, my mother had married my father. So my, my Dene mom and my white settler dad, who's actually so white, he's actually a son of the Mayflower. So I'm a daughter of the Mayflower through him. And I'm, you know, I <laughs> sat to Dene through my mom. So because she married him, uh, mm -hmm. she lost her status. So she became a C-31 and regained her status um, in 1985. And at that time, my parents were going through a really awful, ugly divorce. And despite that, um, my stepmother and my dad thought if I got my status, I would get a free university education. So they were, they were pro getting me my status, me and my brother's status, uh, when she got her status. And then conversely, my grandfather through my dad, who was like white military, was adamantly against us getting our status and now I know why he didn't articulate it very well then um, but he was against us getting it so you know I was raised white I just assumed when I graduated high school in 94 I would be able to go to the UFC and click status native and I would get all of my things and that would be no problem so it turns out that's not the case and uh, so I did not get a free university education through the UFC that was really the impetus of why we got our status. Um, the irony being now that I know who I am and why the Indian Act even exists, uh, became very militant, really militant is the best way to say it, about me not being Canadian. Uh, it took me a lot of unlearning to identify as Satu Dene. Um, I recently had an old friend say, oh, it's interesting you identify as uh, Dene and not half white. And I said to him, well, the reason for that was because when I was in the hospital, despite acting white, thinking white, being white as best as I could, at the hospital, I was red flagged. They didn't see me as half white. They seen me as a status Indian whose child probably needed apprehending. So that, that's why I identify as Satu Dene and not Canadian, because it doesn't matter if I'm a half breed or, or even less. As a status native, the Canadian government sees it as fit to apprehend my child, as you know, able to insert themselves into my life. Um, when Stephen Harper was in charge, he took the Indian status list and he gave it to uh, CSIS and said, oh, here's our domestic uh, eco-terrorist list. And I was labeled. So I got very political. I had no choice but to be political and identify only as Satu Dene, no matter if I'm a half breed or not. Um, oh, that terminology. My daughter used that because we have Maria Campbell's half-breed book. And, um, you know, so my daughter, she's learned about this and such. And it was actually the Calgary Board of Education teachers, along with the uh, Alberta Civil Liberties Association, that said, oh, you can't use that terminology to my daughter, and dismissed her. Um, so, you know, it's so loaded that I have an Indian Act and Post status card, and yet everybody else gets to tell me what terminology I can and cannot use, I cannot use half breed, I cannot use Indian, but these are the terms that Canada imposed on us. So needless to say, um, the Indian Act is, you know, I, I think the other thing I learned about the Indian Act that um, like I knew beforehand was that realization that the Indian Act is not Indigenous governance. That's like the number one misconception that I think all of Canada has is that it was ne never intended to govern. It was intended to have Indian agents, um, you know, have Canadian government influence in all of the reserves that they created. And 
you know, so that's why when I hear people try to talk about, well, people voted for that. I'm like, whoa, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. So I don't remember if this book really got much into that, but I can share with you. Um, I'm a dog ear person, so I apologize in advance and you can unfriend me later. But for the moment, my <laughs> dog ear. Um, so page 34 on the, on the soft cover, I don't know if you have a hard cover, I have one somewhere around the house, but I used the soft cover one because it was easier to, you know, bring around. Something that I read in this renamed individuals with European names. You know, I, I always knew that. Like we have like all the Baptists in Alberta are from that Indian agent and uh, renamed through the priest. Uh, that's just common all across everywhere. And Bob Joseph actually addressed that a little bit in his book. But the way he wrote about that, um, when I think about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there's a section where they talked about having um, all provinces get on board with the fact that a lot of Indigenous would want to rename their name and there should not be a cost to that. And, uh, you know, I, I knew that then, but when I read this page here and I read this little, these couple of pages, you know, it really, really hit me hard. Um, even today, I'm struggling with it because, um, you know, it. and Kasha kind of talked about it a bit using her name. For me personally, I really want to um, determine if I want to change my name. And if I were to change it to Red Thunder Woman, then it would still be in English, which I'm struggling with. And so I want to learn it in Satu Dene because I, I know the Satu word for red, I know it for thunder, and I know it for woman, but I don't know if in a conversation, if I were to use it in that context, if that would make sense. So I have to find a Satu Dene elder uh, willing to help me. Like, how do you say red thunder woman in Satu Dene mm -hmm. so that I can get that to be my legal name and change it? And my daughter, we, I was talking to her because her spirit name is one who sits with grandmothers. And she's not identifying as straight. And in fact, she won't identify as two-spirit in front of white people because she hates the conversation that invokes. So what she will do is call herself pansexual. So we've been talking about, you know, our Alberta healthcare card, our driver's license, things like that can actually change now to not just identifying someone as male or female, but there is a two-spirit option. So I've been trying to talk to her about that because, you know, I don't want to impose either or on her. I'm still uncomfortable with it, but like uh, Kasha, I was raised white. So, you know, I'm struggling with it. I, I have said in my podcast, I've told you many times that the reason why I'm here today is because my name was English. It was Michelle Robinson or Michelle Elliott. So I didn't get that discrimination that mm -hmm. anybody with a, uh, you know, last name that sounded indigenous would receive. So, and I know my, because my, my uh, Dene family is very strong Catholic, very much follow the rules um, type of people. They want to protect me and probably would be against me changing my name. But there's a piece of me that's like, I don't care. Um, I have to do this for me. But I know it'll upset a lot of people in my life if I do it. But anyway, it really struck a chord with me. And that was that I'm, I'm still struggling with it right now. I have a lot more to say. But obviously, I want to share the floor with somebody else who may have read the book. Uh, Dawn and Rosemary, did you want to maybe take the floor? Sure. Sure. Thank you. Um, several years ago, Chantal mentioned to all of us that we should read the Indian Act and uh, because she hates the Indian Act and she wants to see it disappeared or dismantled. Um, and at the time, uh, so I, I tried to read, I did read it and I didn't really, it was very legalistic, you know, it's bits and pieces, etc. But I was interested in learning more because I had approached it from the little bit I knew around the white paper. And all I knew about the white paper was that Indigenous people had opposed just doing away with the Indian Act. And 
while I understood that, uh, you know, it shouldn't be the government doing away with it, it should be indigenous people dismantling it. <clears throat> I just hadn't understood the intricacies of it. So I am so grateful for, for Bob Joseph's book because I, I think it's excellent. I think everybody should read it. Um, while I knew a lot of it, I, I, I don't think I quite understood that it was all coming out of the Indian Act. I think I saw things as like just somehow separate pieces of legislation. One thing that, that um, I just want to speak to two, two sections, the one on agriculture. I knew uh, about what was going on with agriculture from another book, but I hadn't realized that there were indigenous people farming communally and that the government was so desperate to disrupt that and to impose an individualistic approach to farming. So that really stood out for me. And then with the um, section on renaming, as someone who's been uh, very interested in my own family history, searching it, needing names to search for it, um, I was thinking, God, if Indian agents come in and they change everyone's names, and then if you were someone who had, uh, you know, been, been part of the 60s scoop or gone through residential schools, if you didn't have access to oral knowledge around your family name, how, how would you plug into that? And, and I just thought it was really destructive. Um, and the other interesting thing, uh, I had a conversation with Cesar Kala, who's from the Philippines a few years ago. And he said that when the Spanish came, they did the same thing. They changed everyone's names. That's it. So that's all I want to say. <clears throat> okay, so um, <laughs> I <clears throat> I think that that Bob Joseph has, has written a, a really wonderful book, uh, even if it's very difficult <laughs> to read at, at at points because the it what he so successfully shows is how the Indian Act. Uh, implemented all types of discrimination uh, attempts the the attempts to eliminate the indigenous peoples of Canada uh, <clears throat> and the the it the he also shows the uh, by, by using uh, the documents uh, of the colonialist regimes uh, who administered the Indian Act, uh, the contempt that mm -hmm. they had for indigenous people and the extent to which they were willing to harass people and to try and break up uh, the indigenous people's language, culture, ability to access lawyers, ability to form political organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it also reminded me of the settler societies that were established in Southern Africa. Okay, so my parents and I were in show business and to cut the long story short, we were in circus in apartheid South Africa and in uh, what was then uh, colonial Zambia, Zimbabwe. And uh, so I saw quite, quite a bit of, 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 uh, of the racism there. And then I've looked, uh, I, I just see so many parallels between Canada and apartheid colonial Southern Africa. For example, with, with, with regard to farming, uh, in Zambia, in colonized Zambia, colonized Zimbabwe, uh, laws were brought in, regulations were brought in, so that the price that the indigenous farmers got for maize, uh, corn, and uh, cattle 
was set much lower than uh, the pr uh, prices that were, that were given to white settler farmers. And this was, this, this was done consciously by the colonial governments in order to make sure that the colonial farmers could survive, that they could compete because in fact, African farmers were far more productive than the European settler farmers. So it, it was, it was, you know, sort of. I just, you know, and so when I read the sections on agriculture uh, about the obstacles that were placed in the way of indigenous peoples, <clears throat> especially in the, in the, in the West, attempting to uh, learn how to farm, because it's it's quite a, a technological jump. Uh, to to go from uh, the hunting gathering uh, societies, which were here, which were very well organized, uh, to 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 learn you know fixed field farming. So I was just really struck by that. Um, and then I was I was just you know as I said you know I was just really struck by the the grossness and the pettiness of the oppression that's encapsulated in the Indian Act. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Kat, did you get a chance to read the book? Did you want to chime in? Sure. Um, yes, I've read the book. Um, I agree with um, what people have said so far about it being a, um, a brilliant book, very plain, straightforward language. Um, Bob Joseph does a really great job on explaining key points and puts it in really um, basic language that, you know, every settler should read this book. Um, I love at the end that he also includes the history of residential schools, like from start to finish, how that all um, came into being and also the 94 calls of action. I um, think it's great that he put that in the book as well. And also the chapter of course on where do we go from here. So he, he's not just like blah, everything's terrible but here's here's a few things to that we should be doing and um, transitioning from the Indian Act to equal citizenship, equal government would be amazing. Actually I'm happy to just give it all up to you indigenous folks. Let you rule Canada for a while because we've messed it up so so badly. So how about her? You got my vote. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kat. Um, Crystal, did you get a chance to read the book and do you want to chime in? Uh, I did read the book. Um, yeah, I got my overall impression. You know, the other meeting we were talking about what is genocide and we looked up the specific definition and then when I read this book I'm like clearly this was genocide like it's so mm -hmm. obvious it's clear as day that all of these tactics were deliberate intentional and trying to eliminate uh, like Don was saying trying to eliminate a whole people mm -hmm. um, so the that people can still quibble about this it's really it's frustrating but it also I feel, you know, you mentioned South Africa. I feel we need that level of uh, like a healing in our country. Like we're walking around with this gaping wound that we're trying to pretend it doesn't exist and it keeps getting re-injured re over and over. And we need like to that level of uh, healing in our country for us to move forward with anything good at this point. Like, yeah, so that's... And uh, Bob Joseph, I think, um, Kat, maybe you can help, but we read another book by Bob Joseph. That was more of a business, yeah, it was a little more aimed at business focus, but I found, like, again, this very accessible language so that I could give this book to anyone and they could understand exactly what's going on. So it's so valuable to have these texts, yeah. That's my two cents.
Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Crystal. Um, Sarah, did you get a chance to read the book? I don't remember. Yes. Me? Perfect. Can you chime in then? I did. Um, so I definitely agree with everything that everyone has said. It's really a brilliant book. I think it should be required reading in schools multiple times. Um, I tend to have a more uh, like a detail approach to things rather than a big sweeping general. So I'm just going to um, share a few things that really kind of were hit homers for me. Um, one was the passage on the potlatch um, mm -hmm. when they when it was describing how it had been outlawed and um, it says the concept of establishing rank by one's ability to share wealth rather than establish rank by mm -hmm. holding on to wealth mm -hmm. was alien to the Europeans and um, you know maybe as a result anyway they had of course outlawed the potlatch which we know from reading the book that blew my mind because um, I don't even know how to explain how much that blew my mind, but that was really like just such a different worldview. Like mm -hmm. I'm pretty liberal and probably would rate as socialist on a lot of people's scales and, you know, but even for me as somebody who's you know, spend a lot of time thinking about how do we spread wealth? How do we make sure everyone's cared for? Even for me, just reading that point blank, the ability, the concept of establishing rank by one's ability to share wealth. And that also brought home for me just how, in a sweeping way, just how established and healthy and whole that whole process was and how completely the Europeans wanted to sweep it away. They didn't bother to, anyway, that was one thing. Um, another one was in the housing, when they were talking about the housing um, on page 26, um, he says, indigenous people were also forced into European style homes that were inappropriate for the traditional concept of family and often inappropriate for the climate. And that was another one of those moments when it just really hit me, I was like, yeah, our house doesn't work if you are not a very singular um, individualist you know everybody has their own room actually in our house the doors don't lock because it's so old but in most houses the doors lock um and so then i started thinking about like housing even even right down to the housing they were forcing this issue and that is really, that's when you start to really understand deeply in your bones, the level of genocide, you know, they, mm -hmm. they didn't leave any stone unturned. Um, then, um, let's see, on the naming, Michelle, that also really, also got me really thinking, um, you know, as a woman who is married and did, I did take my husband's name, um, and I often think about through the years, I've often thought about like, why was I so eager to do that? Was that okay? You know, just nothing compared. But it, um, he's talking about the naming and he says, none of the great heritage symbolism or tradition associated with the names was recorded, recognized or respected during the renaming mm -hmm. process. And I thought about that too. And I thought about just, I have very, very little exposure to traditional names. I'm very ignorant about it. Um, but I knew, I know your name, Michelle, from having heard you say it in the past. And I thought about, like, if your name had been given to you, or if it was something like that, and then it was, you know, taken away, and suddenly you were John Smith, which meant nothing to you. And um, it's another, another very effective way to completely eliminate a person's identity, pride, connection to others, the people who, who gave the name, the, the people who knew the name, who had spoken the name in anger and love and, you know, um, really, really, um, can I share a couple more or is it, is my time done? Is this okay? Okay. Um, the one that really broke my heart, I'm not even going to dwell on it, was after the girl had been to the school and then returned home for a holiday and she looked at her parents and she hated her parents. She hated them not because they were 
um, anything except because they were indigenous, they were brown and that just was so heartbreaking. And that's when you really understand some of the real crime of what happened there. Um, and then the last thing is Harper gave that nice apology in whatever year it was, they have the text of it in here. It sounds so good. And the very next year, he said at the G20, Canada doesn't have any history of colonialism. We don't have any of that stuff that other nations have. And so then I was, I felt just like I, I you know, I understood a little better. I try to understand before, but I can imagine the rage that must have provoked to hear Harper say that just one year after delivering that apology um, in which so many crimes of colonialism and genocide were acknowledged and really laid out quite nicely. Then just one short year later to, for that to all be out of his head is very frustrating. So anyway, it's a profound book, um, probably one of the books that's impacted me most in my life. This is actually my second time reading it. Um, I've given it to a lot of people as gifts. I, it's, it's a go-to. <laughs> and thank you for the time. Thank you for hearing me. No, I'm grateful, Sarah. Thanks for sharing all of that. I totally want to address everything, but I want to give everybody a chance first. Uh, Jacqueline, uh, I see your videos off if you're comfortable unmuting yourself if you want to uh, chat you're welcome to hello yes sorry um every time my furnace comes on my internet goes wonky so <laughs> i live in a very old house <laughs> uh, but you can hear me okay it's not choppy or anything you bet it's good right <laughs> um yeah well i would echo a lot of what people have already um mentioned and I would just add that one of the other really um, useful things I found about this book was actually in the appendix yep. um, and the definitions provided. Um, because I find often I um, get confused or I forget things. And so just be able to like go and re-remind myself like the different classifications of a chief or um, what the you know different capitalizations are like stuff like that is so helpful um i've been having a lot of conversations on social media with people about what's going on in the east coast and i found this book so helpful to refer back to and and light um and i have a feeling i will be buying copies of it for people in my family too but um the other thing I just uh, I just wanted to mention was, sorry, just looking for my dog ear page. <laughs> dog ears <laughs> rule. Yes, all my books have them. <laughs> I do it to library books too. I'm that person. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, the um, it's similar to what Sarah was saying about the the constant tactic of dividing community, um, and and the individualism, the way that capitalism and colonialism dance together constantly, um, related to the um, the part about agriculture and the the breaking up of people working together. Um, that hit me really hard because I thought about my relatives and the farming community that I come from um, and the ways in which they rely on community to survive and, and thrive. And um, I hadn't even considered like what a privilege that is um, until thinking about it in this context. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, did you want to uh, share some more uh, dog ears or is that kind of where you want to end? Yeah, I think that's where I, I'll, I'll finish off. Thank you. <laughs> sure. 
Um, in the chat room, uh, I posted, I, and I did that earlier when Rosemary was actually talking about the agricultural part. I posted Clearing the Plains and Lost Harvest. Our book club has done it already, but one, it's been for like over four years, and two, you know, it, I mean, we just, it, these are being recorded, right? So if somebody somewhere by chance is stumbling on this book club, I'd love for them to know about those two. And I mean, I, it's not the end of the world for us to revisit either of them anyway, uh, just because the agricultural policies in the Indian Act just seem to be such a strong theme that came from uh, multiple people. So, um, and I don't mean to, um, uh, let, maybe we'll just go through a few more. Uh, and Kathy had asked you, Don, if you found it difficult to read because of the legal jargon or emotionally difficult now, uh, Cashaw said emotional, but is there anything more you'd like to um, elaborate on there, Don? Sure. I mean, the book is really well written. Uh, the mm -hmm. writing just flows. Uh, and and uh, it's the impact of the implications of what the Indian Act has meant uh, that, that, that really hits you. So even though I would have to stop every once in a while, uh, I would always go back to it. So the legal uh, questions, um, well, he, he, he does a really good job of demystifying the terminology of the Indian Act. Because I, I think uh, if, if you, if I attempted to, to go, I mean, in the sections of the Indian Act that are there, you, you just see the wickedness of the intent of the people who wrote the Indian Act to disguise what they were doing. So he does a really good job of deconstructing that. I have a book, I guess I should have dug it up, but it's like, I don't know, uh, Conversations with a Ghost or something like that. And it's a, it's a fictional book, but it's not really fictional because it, it invokes the ghost of uh, um, Duncan Scott, the first oh. Indian agent or uh, Indian minister. And, um, you know, it, it, conversations with him if, if he came back as a ghost and to try to give an idea of what the thinking was at that time. Yes, it's fictional, but the quotes they grab from there and John A. MacDonald and so many people like it, they're absolutely horrifying. It's, it is definitely like the number one horror, movie, or horror book I could recommend to you all. Um, and I, I just bring that up because it's kind of back to what Don is saying, like that evil thinking at that time. It, it wasn't like to us, it's evil. To Hitler, you know, it's evil. But at the time, it was, well, you know, these inferior beings, savages, and they just this British white supremacist belief system of superiority just oozes through all of these quotes. And that's what the real evil is, right? That assumption of supremacy. Um, so, and, and I had a question pri privately sent to me asking what we do with the recording. And so what I do is I put it on my YouTube page now. Um, and I ask people if they're comfortable with anything that was said because I can stop the recording and start it again. So if you at any point in time are uncomfortable, if you want to share something privately, we can stop the recording and then restart it afterwards. So I, if at any point in time you have something very personal that you want to share that you don't want public, just let me know and we will um, pause it so that you can say what you'd like to say before we go back. Um, and then I guess a uh, Kathy says, for those that read the book, do you read the book before reading the Indian Act or vice versa? Should I read the Indian Act before reading the book? Um, you know, I would recommend, Kathy, that you just read them both um, continuously because, um, you know, for me, I mean, I literally have been reading the Truth and Reconciliation uh, volumes and series for five years. And even when I kind of recome, when I come back to it and readdress it, I still interpret it a little different because of everything that I've learned from the first time I read it to, to now. So, um, you know, I would just recommend you read this book because, you know, I hate legal jargon and you and I are in a party where it's like, ugh, 
if I could read, like I literally will read a constitution to go to sleep because it's so boring. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, you know, you can read the Indian Act. It's the same type of legal jargon where it's just like, if you really need to be put to sleep, read it. But the book from Bob Joseph, obviously a lot more stimulating. Cause like, for example, with the naming, he's so open and honest, like Joseph, yes, that's the name the Indian agent gave me and my family, but that's not who I am, you know, and, and really reframing that. So I highly recommend reading both, but maybe even start with this 21 things because, um, and it was referenced at the back, especially for our teachers, because I think Crystal, uh, you identify as one as well. Um, like in the back, there's things that you can do so there's classroom activities discussion guide um additional reading true or false exercises 21 things you can do to help change the world and they're super easy things too like especially because it's halloween number 18 speak up when you observe cultural appropriation ensure you don't promote cultural appropriation when choosing a halloween costume Boop, boop there, so simple <laughs> um so yeah that, that was some of the other questions. Um, Kat had responded, I read this book first. It seems like a good um, basis to have before reading the act. And because it was brought up the 26, uh, we were talking in page 26, that really in page 27 went on to the uh, in forced enfranchisement and really the male dominated part of the Indian Act. Mm -hmm. And um, after we're done the TRC, we'll probably start moving into the inquiry. So I just, I wanted to really point out that page 27, that little mm -hmm. section, because if we're going to move on to the MMIW uh, inquiry, you can see the basis, like this is legislative sexism and racism, but still mm -hmm. in fact in 2020, which is why of course we have this huge problem in the inquiry, which I know will be laid out in the inquiry uh, volume as we all go through it, but that bigger picture of, um, you know, you, you can see it. Right, and I, I just wanted to throw that at everybody so that um, you have that as an understanding of a, uh, an understanding, a basis of understanding prior to going into the inquiry as well. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I think I got everybody who had read the book. Was there anyone that had read the book that I missed? Okay, and to the folks that didn't read the book but heard the discussion, maybe we'll start with Heather. Would you want to chime in with anything? Yeah, so I didn't actually get the copy of the book. I'm, I'm, it's on a reserve, at reserve, <laughs> at the library. Anyway, uh, but I did uh, see a lot of Joseph Robert Josephs on on uh, YouTube, and uh, he's been a professional educator, trainer, uh, integrator. I don't like bridging cultures since 1994. His training program and so he's pretty good at what he does because either a he wouldn't have lasted this long or b he wouldn't have lasted this long so so uh, I can see why he would be pretty articulate he comes from the Comox Port Hardy area which was where the uh, MP came from as well I don't know if they're the same uh, you know band or or what but they're from the same area and um i saw a bit of his blog like i say i picked up a couple of the youtubes so very articulate person to listen to i did you know cover some of the indian act stuff when i took indigenous studies and of course it's come up time and again with the uh and especially it well one uh a long time ago i saw a uh a, a documentary maybe on aptn um and it was a young woman down east and she was turning 16 or 17 and what she had to do at that point in her life was to gather all of her family trees and it didn't matter that she grew up on reserve on six nations or where she grew up or who her parents were she had to gather all her information and submit it to the band for them to decide if she was Indian. And that just blew me away because she was raised indigenous, she was raised heritage, she was raised, you know, by with her, her elders and her grandparents and everyone involved. And she had to gather this information and this information was going to decide her heritage, not herself. And it just blew me away at the time. I still, um, 
I, you know, I mean, I'll always remember that. Um, that's about all. Right now. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. I agree with everything else. Awesome. Um, like, just to give you an idea of that, though, um, there's been some changes in the Indian Act. Um, and Murray Sinclair, he told me, you better apply for your daughter. And my daughter really wants her status. And as her mother, I'm scared as hell to give it to her. But two, it's back to what Heather is saying. I have to get um, all these birth certificates, my marriage certificate, all of these things put together instead of, you know, then just realizing, you know, Michelle Robinson had a kid. This is her kid. Why do I have to put together yeah. all of this documentation and send it in? It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, with my in, Does I've tried like to that talk grandparents Sorry? Don't like this young woman seemed to have to prove like grandparents and heritage and all of this other stuff too. So yeah, it's ridiculous. Absolutely yeah. ridiculous. I guess what because, I'm trying to say know, though, Heather, it's 2020. And my daughter does not have her status because of all of this ridiculous hoopla. And that mm -hmm. and that's and that's wrong. I don't care what anybody has to say. That's wrong. So yes, I'm raising my yeah. daughter to be a proud Satu Dene. But the bottom line is is that you know, I don't need the Canadian government to tell me she's native, uh, but they think they need to tell us whether or not we're native. And we have to somehow prove to them that we're native. And I, I can't tell you how infuriating it is. Like we should burn the whole system down for that reason alone, <laughs> let alone the million other mm -hmm. reasons that we should burn it down. But uh, just to yes. add to what you're saying. Um, now, uh, Roberta, Bertie, do you want to chime in from the discussion you've heard? Yeah, yeah, I would. Um, I'm struck with with what you're saying and what other people have been saying is how how insidious it is. What an insidious and calculated um, attempt effort to separate people. When you look at food, food production, language, culture, everything, and you kind of legislate against that, so you separate people from who you are, and then you separate, and and then that that becomes that it's institutionalized and then I'm struck with the kind of willful blindness um, or obliviousness of people in everyday Canadian culture who when you try to talk about it cannot see how systemic it is until you start to say and you know you have to make up you have to you have to sort of replicate it in their lives you know if someone came in and took your house and your kids and your food and your language and institutionalized it so made it okay so you have to defend and explain who you are all the time um so i just find that and i've been watching some movies um on canopy about indigenous culture in in australia and seeing the sort of parallel there, um, just exactly the same thing. They had the same 60 scoop, the same kind of insidious, calculated, systemic approach. Um, yeah, it's it's um, it, it's stunning. I find it stunning. Yep. Oh, thanks so much for chiming in, Kathy. You've been hearing us speak and uh, ask a lot of great questions. Is there something else you'd like to chime in with? Yes, I wanna thank everyone for their shares and also Michelle for giving me that encouragement to come earlier today. Um, I had the invite for this club for a while and I have to say I was really intimidated because I know I'm very like new um, to learning about the history and the issues so um but the last book michelle recommended was a good book as well <laughs> so now i'm remembering okay these are good books to read and i i really value everyone's shares because i'm not so intimidated i know that um it's a uh it can be a difficult read um but i feel that this is I'm also, I would say, new to activism. Um, I've been very privileged as a Canadian-born Chinese um, Canadian, and um, English is my basically my first language. So um, when I come here, I realize um, I have a lot of privileges that a lot of people don't, and how do I educate myself on 
difficulties other people are having. So I think this kind of sharing and of knowledge is very valuable to me. So I want to thank everyone for that. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. And I'm going to read the book. <laughs> hey, that's great. Well, and I, th I thought I, we had a convo and you had said that you even owned it. So it was like, you know, even if you just start flipping through it, um, we have another mutual colleague and I told him, I'm like, you just throw that in your bathroom for the week. I promise you'll have it done by the end of the week. So, because <laughs> it's, a, it is an easy read. Um, and is there a chance that I missed anybody in our first round here? Or I, I, would you like to chime in at all? Um, as a response to some of the things that you heard Kasha from the uh, different you know points that were brought up and maybe your experience yeah I, I do want to chime in <laughs> uh, first of all like if you haven't read the book um, read it um, he uses a lot of big words so it's not a dummy down version um, it's just concise and uh, the fellow that was reading it, it I I would get the, the sense that maybe he hadn't used that word before or I don't know just I could be just too yeah but I just thought no if, if you want to read the book then you pick it up and read it but you know you're getting read to by some young man so just just keep listening to it um, but I think what really struck me is the storytelling and that's huge and I can relate to that because I need to to speak my truth and um, even though I grew up um, not knowing my Teltan language, I didn't know my dad's Gitsan language, I didn't know that my grandmother knew, could speak fluent Gitsan until after she had passed away. Then we found out many years later that she, she was a fluent speaker. Um, so, yeah. So I, I have to, to know what my story is. And I think that's what Bob does so well is that he knows his story. And plus he's been gifted stories from other people and they're just so powerful. And they just really struck a chord with me. Um, I mean, even I'm so glad that people talked about the naming um, because my name Kaw Shaw, I can still hear my grandpa correcting me how to say it. Kaw Shaw, <laughs> it's like, because of the barred A's like, so um, I, I, there was a time there that I wasn't even saying it correctly. But I, um, I grew up knowing Teltan language, some Teltan words, because it was part of our family. And I didn't discriminate against anybody that wasn't, but I grew up in Lahaine, which is Prince Rupert. And I'm from, my people are from Iskut and um, Telegraph Creek, which is up north. So I'm living on the coast. And even um, the different type of, well, different different nations are different it's not like one people it's every we're all nations and um here they have a much hierarchy a, a different hierarchy the way they, they the way they live um because they could settle along the ocean they could they didn't have to move they could you know work on their artwork and all of this really great interesting stuff and um but, you know, I don't know what my name means. And I had a young man up in Teltan territory tell me um, that it's okay if you don't know what your name means, because not every name has to mean something. Not every traditional name has to mean something. But I do know that it was because, um, because of what has happened to us that we, we lost those meanings and we lost where they came from. And my grandma, um, my grandpa passed away when he was 101 and seven months, just in um, uh, just after we had the 100th uh, celebration of our Teltan Declaration because we have never ceded our, our traditional area ever. And um, he, it was like he stayed alive just for that. Um, but names, again, when he was, um, when they went to register him, um, his dad was also past his white, but he was Cherokee, part Cherokee. Um, they wouldn't let him spell my grandpa's name the way they wanted to spell it. And not that many years ago, I said to my mom, how come you're spelling your name differently now? And it, she didn't tell me, but even her, and I'm talking about a first name, um, again, the, um, they, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't let her spell it the way they, they wanted to. So then she decided to have a switch and she was going to say it the way that the... Um, 
um, the way that they wanted her to spell it. So the, um, the, the Indian agent. So it was pretty powerful. But my grandpa, like I was saying, um, I, I was a granddaughter until I was 50, right? <laughs> but, you know, he never went to a potlatch. But he knew that when people came home to the ranch, um, they would talk about it. But he was never allowed to go. And I guess they were protecting him by keeping him home. But I mean, his, his mom passed away at a very young age, but the, the guys in the, uh, that worked on the ranch were allowed to speak Teltan to him. But not so much in my, um, my other grandfathers. They forbade the usage of the language. So um, it, it's just, I'm just uh, um, quite, um, moved that um, reading a book such as this would would help me to move forward in in, in my journey. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't expect that, but I think there's power in in speaking your your story, and I'm I'm beginning to realize that now because of the way that I am. I mean, my ancestors are in me, and this is how I've always been. I've always been a, a, a sharing story and talk. And so when I do that sometimes, um, folks, uh, I get the sense that they're just like, oh no, she's gonna tell us another story. <laughs> and until, until you get to know me, I, I mean, I listen to your story too. I said, I wanna know your story. But, um, but now I can see that this is, this is who I am and this is kind of like the way I am, the way I am and, and, it, and it's okay. Um, and so it is probably because my voice has been a, a, like a minority. In, in that in that sense so um yeah but i mean i could relate to a lot of stuff but i but i do know that this is like a public recording as well and i don't have permission to tell people's story and that's another thing is um if something's been gifted to me a story we can't just like blurt it out and and, and tell everybody depending on what it is we have to get their permission or one thing i've recently learned um as well is that um, I can just, I mean, because maybe stuff is not really super personal, but and I guess I've always been like this, but it just really um, brought home that it's okay is I give credit to the people that told me it. <laughs> and that's, and that's pretty powerful. Um, just in, just in closing, um, one of my elders, who's a, um, a spokesperson for the get -Gots here in town, he um, was invited to a, a do that I was invited to and they wanted him to do a welcome and he he wasn't able to go so he says to me well why don't you um well he didn't say to me but the people putting it on said well julie could you just give a um like a, an, a land acknowledgement so i did but i worked with him to put together what i was going to say and his message to me was julie after you say the um land acknowledgement be sure to tell them that i told you that that you could say that. So I remember giving the land acknowledgement and then some people in the room were kind of going when they heard his name. So then if I did, if I misrepresented anybody in any way, then it's sort of like it's his fault. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it's like, okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll do that. So um, yeah, and, and even my name, uh, I, I was part of a, um, I don't know what she says, but I was part of a group and somebody had made up their name and it was similar to mine. Oh. And all my granny's life, she was waiting to meet somebody else that was named Kawshaw. And one day when they were bringing the, um, the basket weaving home to this area from Alaska, she heard a woman that was um, talking and she had said her name and my granny thought she had heard Kawshaw. And so she said, Julie, you have to bring me up there. So when they were, when they were on a break, I brought her up there and um, they talked with each other and the woman didn't know her name either, but she joked with my granny. Uh, she said, oh, it means pretty woman. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I mean, it was her quest was truthfully was to, um, to find out what her name meant and she didn't know but I, I would think it was something that she wanted to know because she she could speak some of the language um, and as she um, when she got older one of my sisters got really involved in 
um, speaking the language. So that brought a lot of pride to my grandparents and um, they would they started speaking the language at home and even grandpa would get me to speak it but I don't know my mind my, my head space wasn't there in, in in speaking the language at the time so I'm I don't mind typing um, tell ten words into my email and to my letters and things like that but um, I'm probably not going to be one of these people that are that are speaking the language. I don't even know the Teltown survival words, but but what I want to do is I want to help people become teachers so they can become language teachers. So um, there's there's always something you know for me to do, and yeah, I, I would recommend this that everybody read this book as well. Um, it's sort of like a no brainer, and it's uh, it's it's not it's not very long. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but I hear celebration of the, those 21 things. Like, it's, in a way, it's like it's, those are the probably the 21 that really pissed him off. <laughs> True. <laughs> Bad dude. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks, everybody, for your first share. I just, uh, it's so funny because I'm looking at the time and it's already like almost eight, and I feel like, ah. We have so much to say, but I, I love hearing everybody share and ask questions, so thank you. Um, you know, a, a point I really wanted to bring up, uh, and especially because of all of the problems that we have today, uh, we talk a lot today about, um, you know, treaty and laws, and on page 73, uh, you know, prohibiting anyone, Indian or non-Indian, from soliciting funds for Indians to hire legal counsel. Mm. Um, I don't know how many people I tell how hard it is, um, you know, in 16. So imagine Kathy and I, well, actually, I don't think there's anyone on this call that's not political. Imagine on page 70, forbid Indians from forming political organizations. Of course, we still yeah. form political organizations. And uh, of course, the law was, you know, put to one side so that we weren't allowed to have legal uh, representation or be able to fundraise or that. But, um, you know, as a Canadian that talks about human rights and, you know, access to equality and all of these things, when you read a section like that, how does that, uh, how does that hit you? Maybe we'll start with Don and Rosemary. Well, um yeah, I mean, it hits one, <laughs> definitely. And I think, I mean, the government, they knew what they were doing because look what's happened as a result of, <laughs> thank God, of political organizing and access uh, to lawyers and the legal system. I mean, things have really, I, I know there's tons to do. I'm not trying to say it's fixed. We just have to look at what's going on in Halifax to see that it's still awry. But um, the, the, those tools have been so well used to bring the issues forward, I think, to the Canadian public. And um, one, one thing, like, I, I just want to build on something you said and someone else that uh, everyone's been saying they're going to give it as gifts. And I think, yes. And I, and I think when we give it to people, say, you want to understand what white supremacy is? Here it is. You want to understand what we mean when we say that our country was built on racism or is steeped in the racist, you know, the white supremacist racist relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, here it is. And the other thing I found myself thinking about a lot reading this was, um, and it made me, like I never did finish, but I'm continuing to read Jody Wilson Raybolt's book from where I stand because her I mean in all of her speeches no matter whom she's giving them to whether it's indigenous peoples non-indigenous peoples it's about the need to get rid of the Indian Act and then you know you have Bob Joseph's book making illustrating so clearly why we need to get rid of it what's important though she has a whole section on governance where she talks about initiatives that have been already taken, especially in BC by different nations, to, to implement self-government self and to take themselves out of the Indian Act. And I, and I, 
it's very powerful to read that because I think a lot of people, they're going to say, well, well, you know, what are you, how are you going to do it? Well, I mean, the, the nations in BC, they've even put together a toolkit on how to, you know, decolonize and get out from under the Indian Act. Like, it, it's there. And, th and that raises big issues for me of why in Alberta don't we see that same kind of movement that's been happening in BC around getting out from under the Indian Act? Well, I think we have to start by acknowledging, <laughs> though, that they didn't sign treaty. So yes, um, that's we true. have that spiritual covenant. <laughs> Um, and again, I know most Canadians don't see it as a spiritual covenant, but it's our spiritual covenant. And uh, we respect that spiritual covenant. Um, and in BC, they didn't have the same treaty signing that we had here. Um, and I think the other part, like, let's just acknowledge that today in 2020, we have um, a bill, Bill 1, that basically labels me as a domestic terrorist for having the audacity to, you know, want to... Exercise, mm -hmm. exercise my civil uh, rights that would be afforded to regular Canadians but are not afforded to me. I become a domestic terrorist by simply being an Indian and talking about my sovereignty, right? So there's a lot of differences there. Uh, but also, even despite the, in the Indian Act here where they said that you were prohibited, um, you know, and, and actually Hugh Dempsey has a really great book um, uh, called The Adventure. Oh, by the way, the other book is called Confessions of a Dead Man. I looked it up. Uh, that's a really good book. Really recommend it. But Hugh Dempsey, on, uh, he has a book about his adventures. Always an adventure. I have it up there. And he, ta he actually articles a lot of the um, activism that was happening in like the 30s and such. And that was when the start of the Métis settlement activism was happening as well. Like, yeah, it was against the law. But regardless, Alberta was one of the ones that were like some of the loudest when it came to activism. Organizing. And even to today, because it's 2020 and we're all, um, you know, considered domestic terrorists, we're still organizing, right? Um, and I just seen here in the comments from uh, Kasha, learning, uh, do you want to maybe chime in and say this word? Kasha? No, I don't know the word. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. You could use your English accent. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, like these are some really, really good um, points about undrip, uh, not finishing the line with Jody Wilson Rainbow, May 12th, 2021. Yep. Really great ideas as well. Um, yeah. So Anybody else want to chime in about uh, not being allowed to politically organize and the uh, law to actually outlaw allowing Indigenous legal representation or fundraising for any representation? It's just basic fascism, right? Fascism 101. <laughs> yeah. So grateful. Thank well, you. As far as law goes right now, I was just reading, I'm on a uh, I'm on an email list, uh, Indigenous Law, and they send a list of stuff going on every week. And uh, it was just knocked down that they were trying to outlaw, you know, uh, on jury selection. You know how biased the juries get. Mm -hmm. And so they were trying to outlaw that biasness and how it had to be more random selection and you get who you get kind of thing and you weren't allowed to choose and negate like who was coming up and that they said no we still want control of that so that that didn't fly so go figure just yeah just one give of those, your perspective i've been called to the jury and three times and uh rejected every time isn't that amazing i know we're all shocked and when i was at the museum at ubc that's the museum of anthropology and anyways, and so they had the potlatch dishes there. Those things are the size of small trains and they're, they're carved, they're the size of canoes, right? They're, they're carved like a canoe. They have wheels on them because they're like the size of my, I've got a love seat couch here. And I'm like, yeah, it was about the size of that seating area. And that was the dishes that the potlatch was served in, right? You know what I mean? So we don't even understand, I don't even, I couldn't even fathom cooking for that many people. I don't understand that level of generosity. You know, I mean, um, 
we, we just don't, don't do that, right? It's just not a do. And they, and in Northern BC, Indigenous people do that, do that for the first anniversary of a death. They invite everyone and everyone gets fed. And if, and food is always included in everything, like when we do Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, it used to always include food, right? Until this year, right? And so it's just that inclusiveness, that communalness that, um, of course, they, it was, they tried to can, put their thumb on. <laughs> Roberta, do you have? Uh... Yeah, yeah, I was thinking of the, the word fascist um, that Kat mentioned. Um, I was thinking how fascist it is if you, if you steal from people and then you remove access to justice through political and social activism, you then create a kind of fascist system to rationalize your own sort of theft of some of, of somebody else. It's yeah. a strange it's a strange evil, I think, to be able to do that. Like it's like cut it, cutting it down completely when you can't, you can't, you have no, no access to justice, I guess, is when you remove the access to justice from people. And we see that, of course, happening in the States with, with um, Black Lives, Black Lives Matter. And you, it, it's so systemic. It's so systemic. And that's what strikes me is how uh, at every single level, how systemic and institutionalized it is. And I, I don't know that language, the word fascist, I'm thinking sometimes I, I'm trying to strive for a language to, to try to speak to people about how, how it works. To take it out of it seems kind of, people will talk about it in a kind of innocent way, but as soon as you say, no, this actually, this is how you remove justice from people. People have, don't have legal access to justice, that's really evil. That's a, that's a deadly system. Um, today, so when I, when I ran provincially, one of the problems I was hoping I could underhandedly fix was the lack of funding when it comes to people in poverty and the lack of funding for Glad You Reporting. And even for the Glad You Reporting, the funding's not even necessarily always the problem, but it's also having the lens like they have some serious white settler victim blaming jerks that are, are sadly in charge of Glad You reporting here in Alberta. There's only a small number of people who can do it at anyway, and it's underfunded. So not everyone has access to that. On top of that, um, it's the money issue as well. Uh, not everybody has representation when they should. It's easier to plead guilty and get a lesser sentence than it is to, you know, say, no, this actually, I didn't do this but I just don't have the means to be able to fight this in court. So of course I don't, um, or I get so traumatized by being in um, any type of, you know, institution, pr prison institution, that the, I'd do anything to get out of there as quick as I could, even plead guilty to something I'm not guilty for, right? Um, so that bigger picture of like how, um, unjust our system is and today you know black and indigenous people are so overrepresented because it was determined that way and through the start of the indian act that bias of uh, not allowing us to have that legal representation etc cetera, etc cetera. so um really important points to bring i think we lost somebody accidentally here um so before we lose another person would it be all right if you don't want to come on screen i'll understand but um, I'd like to take a picture of us so that uh, I can use it as a thumbnail to put onto the YouTube when I upload the YouTube. So Jacqueline, if you're comfortable with um, coming on screen and um, I'll just do a quick countdown to take that picture. Uh, so, so my eyes are open. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Or if they're closed, then that's that, that you were meant to be seen that way. <laughs> right on. Okay, three, two, one. Yay! Let's hope that, that works. <laughs> oh, that yeah, funny. perfect. Um, and I'm going to share my screen here because there was a few emails that I had gotten that I know we wanted to talk about. Um, and I also wanted to share, um, you know, follow Bob Joseph on Twitter 
he actually did reply to us. He was super happy that we were having this book club, by the way. So um, he did tweet back at us and you can see a lot of people respect him and follow him. And he's been nothing but super kind on Twitter to me as well. So I really like following him. I hope uh, you consider following him as well. If, if you're a Twitter person, I mean, uh, social media. Such a bane of existence in some ways, right? So, um, so. I follow Bob, and that's how I found out about this. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Oh, I was trying to update our book list here, but I never, never got a chance to finish it. Um, okay, so Kat had sent us, uh, I guess we could probably start talking about that activism, but before I do, um, there was, I think Rosemary shared, maybe it was Kat. Somebody shared with me first that there's an event me. with Joseph. Oh. Is this it? Yeah. Tomorrow? No, no that this wasn't is all me. activism stuff. Somebody sent me that a link me. basically saying that um, Bob Joseph is having an event. And so I wanted to encourage you all to follow his Twitter for that reason. But by the time they had sent it to me and I had clicked on it, it was already full at capacity anyway. And it was like tomorrow night or the day, night after or something. So it was really short notice too. Um, but I wanted to just, you know, encourage everybody there. Um, and then, so I don't know more. Uh, okay. So a lot of us are organizing behind the scenes and um, Saturday is going to be our event here in Calgary. Um, because this is recorded, I'm not going to give all the details, but we do have a Facebook event page and all of you are more than welcome to call me anytime offline or through another um, app that's less tracked because as we all know I'm somehow a domestic terrorist now that I'm a indigenous woman trying to stand up for equality in Canada under the Indian Act um, but also follow I don't know more obviously if you're already not on their email list you you should be or at least try to be if you can obviously you know I would like to see you all on Treaty 7 email lists um, Métis Nation of Alberta, Métis Settlements of Alberta, um, the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Stony Nakoda, um, the Sutina emails. Like I'd like to see us all on that as treaty partners, but also I don't know more uh, for the activism as well. Um, because as it's been very clear to me through this new wave of generation of uh, activism through Black Lives okay, Matter, just... like we have existing infrastructure that's not being utilized, which is you know, disappointing, but it is what it is. So us old people are trying to promote the new stuff onto the new sites. And of course we have new um, white en environmentalist organizations that are trying to, um, you know, create their infrastructure as well. So lots going on there. Um, these are some of the hashtags that we've been using because there's so many damn things Canada w is fighting us on. Um, so if you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to reach out. Although I'm sure there's lots of us that are in this thread that would. Uh, so I think this was what Rosemary had sent, which right. is a really great resource here. Um, so Spring, a magazine of socialist ideas in action. Probably another great newsletter for us all to um, subscribe to. And th I read through this. So this was a really great um, outline. Did you want to discuss it at all? Rosemary? Well, just that I, that I felt she, she laid things out so clearly that, um, you know, the Mi'kmaq are exercising their treaty rights. She's very clear about, you know, what, that this is white settler colonialism in terms of the response of the commercial, commercial uh, fisher people. And she even has, she has a link at the end, or except if you do e-transfers, somehow you can support. Because that's what I was looking for, was how we could be supporting mm -hmm. Mi'kmaq and all of this. And, and to me, this is a perfect illustration of, okay, they have the treaty right, but, if, but as Wilson Raybolt says, if the government would approach it as indigenous crown, you know, negotiations and relationships, it would just be so clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it would just be laid out and get done. And, uh, and then the whole issue of, um, you know, which we've heard on the radio about defining what is a moderate income from the fisheries. And then I think, so what do the commercial 
fishermen? Is, are they going to have a moderate income too? Do you know what I mean? Like, where's the balance in all of this? And the numbers, like the numbers of Mi'kmaq fishing for lobster is so small compared to the number of uh, commercial fishermen. And there's an assumption like that people, and she makes it so clear this is not about conservation. That, that's what the commercial fishermen are saying. It's not about cons conservation because what it reveals is how non-Indigenous people have no understanding of what stewardship of land and resources has meant for Indigenous peoples because that's how you survive. Anyway, I've said enough. No, I think that's exactly what needs to be said, Rosemary. I appreciate you saying that. And as you spoke, I, I tried to bring up that point because the whole reason why they, there needs to be conservation to begin with is because of the overfishing that the commercial fishermen were doing to begin with. Yes. Um, so, and I just to bring back to your point, like, you know, they have a 400 trap limit while we were only issued five licenses with 50 mm -hmm. traps each. That's mm -hmm. a significant difference between mm -hmm. Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And, you know, when they're talking about moderate uh, livelihood, I mean, they need to eat. Um, and we're not included in the white settler commercial fishermen. We're not. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm grateful that you pointed it out. And uh, I'll uh, stop sharing here so that we can put the link in our chat so that if anybody doesn't have it, you can uh, copy it now before we end. So that you have it and um mom baby paste there we go all right so that that's the uh link that you had sent us that we wanted to make sure everybody had um just in case and i don't think i'm sharing screen sharing again am i but i think that was all that we wanted to discuss and show um as well so uh back to bob joseph's work again Follow him on Twitter. Follow He has a, a website. You can see some of the events that he has going on. Um, and for the links of donation, uh, Rosemary pointed out it's in the one that she gave, but it's also like if you follow me on Twitter, I've been sharing that as well. Um, okay. Indian Agent has been sharing that information. I don't know more has been sharing that information. I've been resharing okay. it, being retweeted in. Um, idle more idle no more treaty seven as well as in uh you know my facebook page native calgarian so it, it's not from a lack of the information getting out there and being shared it's just as we all know oh algorithms have you all watched the social dilemma no, no? nobody knows what I'm, okay not everyone cat knows what i'm talking and sarah <laughs> she's seen it okay um so on netflix right now there's a great uh uh documentary style movie about the algorithms coming from like the ex social media um, initiators from you know Twitter and Reddit and all of the major social media folks that were a part of you know making the like button on Facebook and it, it has a kind of a fun little side plot where it talks about you know having the computer of algorithms and what they're doing to try to entice people to stay on social media. Oh. And so it has a bit of a storyline to talk about that. And they have like psychologists talking about how basically, you know, what algorithms really are, but how they are affecting our human brains and rewiring mm. what we're doing. And as you all know, on this call back in the long time ago, when we knew Saturday morning cartoons were really important to kids, we outlawed, you know, sugar cereals and all sorts of certain programming that weren't allowed to be directed at kids. Whereas with social media, it's like the opposite. It's like what really screws up the kids' brains to stay on my social media and that, you know, constant marketing. So, um, and how that's rewiring their brains. And as we all know, I mean, everyone on this already knows the problems that teenage girls have with you know, the marketing that's out there and the fat shaming and the insecurities and all of those crazy things and mm -hmm. how that's all put into social media and exacerbated and to the point where, you know, people are getting plastic surgeries so that they can get the right selfie picture, um, all sorts of things. Um, okay, uh, so have First Peoples and Indigenous programs on even if you aren't watching Netflix. What a great point. So if you 
you know how you have background noise? Um, I put on APTN so that that way I'm, you know, helping them as a network, but also that bigger point that, you know, rather than having Rush Limbaugh, not that anybody here would listen to Rush Limbaugh in the background <laughs> influencing your thinking, you know, it's back to that algorithms and trying to show, um, you know, where you're, where you put your time, money, and effort and algorithms into. So that's a great point. Um, anyway, really highly recommend it. Um, my daughter rolled her eyes because she's like, you guys think we're so stupid. Your generation thinks we're so stupid. And that, and that is her belief system. And it's not that we're wrong. It's just that, you know, she's 13. So we know how marketing affects young girls. We know how marketing affects youth. We know how um, social media, like this is the first generation that's had total exposure to social media through screens. I mean, two-year-olds know how to work iPads. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a real issue. And then you actually have folks who made and designed these algorithms going, oh, I didn't see the negative ramifications of my actions at that time because obviously Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was not required reading. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You guys see what I'm saying though, right? Um, yes. That bigger point that um, ethics of science and ethics of what they were doing was obviously not top priority when creating this. So really important. Uh, Kat uh, says that uh, CBC GEM has a lot of Indigenous and Black programming. Um, yeah, there's some good podcasts coming out. I would also um, encourage Eighth Fire. Uh, Eighth Fire from CBC has lots of documentaries. I mean, I haven't watched them in a long time, so they might feel even outdated to me at this point. Um, and because it's already 20 after, I should probably mention. So our next book club is on uh, the calls to action from uh, missing children, unmarked graves, and residential schools starting at 71. Um, now, I know yeah, obviously Heather and some other folks said like I recommend the library first and foremost, but um, I, I would love to see everybody own their own copy of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and volume four specifically is about the missing children and unmarked burials. So very specific to these next calls to action. And, um, you know, I um, shared in our last book club that I tried to go to the Dumbo um, industrial school and oh yeah yeah so I wasn't given access and um, I mean this is a problem nationally the Red Deer uh, industrial school has some of the highest number of dead indigenous children and that's private property now um, my Indian residential school is still open to the public um, and we have a huge gravesite there I'll obviously get more into that next time but um, nationally there's lots of um i mean was it the indian act was it this book who said this please correct me if i'm wrong but they said what year it was in this book that kind of blew me away it was like 1932 that they changed from the terminology of industrial school and boarding school to indian residential schools that was the change in that terminology and uh, so that's why when I say industrial school, it's still an Indian residential school. If I say boarding school, it's still an Indian mm -hmm. uh, residential school. It's st still the same thing. But the terminology matters, right? Uh, because it's that shift in that particular year. I'm sure it was in this book that told me. Regardless, regardless. Um, anyway, uh, so we all identify as settlers or um, even if we're Indigenous that we come from different places. So, you know, your homework, obviously, if you can own or read this book, that would be great. Or if you can just read the TRC calls to action so that we can have that discussion. But that bigger picture is that as settlers, treaty partners, and we try to figure out our relations, you know, I'll probably go into a long conversation about um, my people, um, my family history, and show you some pictures, my personal pictures of my Indian residential school, the graves and, and such, and how it's marked. And it was marked pre uh reconciliation so you can see the different terminology compared to post reconciliation TRC um, so it, you know whatever if you grew up I don't know in Nova Scotia I'd love to hear more about where you're from and the you know Indian residential schools you were surrounded by and whether or not they have their um, graves marked or if it's 
private property because I think that there's a serious need for a campaign. Um, you know, and I called Aaron a tool out on this on Twitter and on my Facebook and I said, look, you mofo, because he had the audacity to say, we're changing our history. Well, if you have, you know, dead indigenous graves and you sell off that land as private, who's changing history now? And I told him, I'd be happy to take your John A. McDonald statues and shove them right where they <laughs> belong, which is to mark properly the amount of dead indigenous people with his genocidal policies. That's where they belong. Um, you know, so it'll be interesting to see. Oh, obviously, I'm already started on my rant and I apologize. <laughs> this is not going to end in my lifetime. So, you know, I, I encourage you all to figure out your rant. You know, if you grew up in Toronto. Love to hear about the closest Indian residential school to you and the graves and if they properly marked it. Maybe we'll talk a bit about White Goose Flying, um, Jack White Goose Flying and the grave that's in the Queen Cemetery. So lots to discuss, but um, I, I know some folks here are, you know, have the means to buy a book and, you know, I'd love to see you have all own the TRC volumes, but this one specific because of the next, um, section that we're working on. So I'm, I apologize, we are already at 823. So maybe we'll just do some close, closing thoughts and we'll start with Don and Rosemary. Just thank you so much again, Michelle, for organizing this to everyone for what you've had to say. Awesome, thanks Rosemary. And I, I would agree with everything that Rosemary said about that. So thank you, Michelle, thank you all. Oh, honored. Thank you, Don. I always appreciate your perspective on South African um, apartheid. So I appreciate that, Rosemary. Many years of activism, I constantly refer to you with your anti-racism work that you've tried to work with the Calgary Public Board of Education on. So, so much respect. Um, Roberta or Bertie. Yeah, thank you as well. Yeah, I, I, I learned a lot and yeah, I, I enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kat, you want to um, do a plug too for your book club? Yes. Um, yes. I'm grateful <laughs> um, to always be here and learn from all of you. And thanks again, Michelle, for all your emotional labor, um, not only in running this book club, but in all aspects of your life. Um, my uh, Settlers Book Club is next Monday. And if you want, um, I can email you the link. And our book is Me and White Supremacy. Another light read, ha ha ha. <laughs> 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 Which is not really, oh my God. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll start talking about that too. So yeah, thanks again, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Kat. No, this is such important work. I'm so grateful you're doing it too and can't thank you enough. Um, Kathy, do you want to uh, have, do you have any lasting thoughts about your, about the book club? Um, I look forward to returning next month. It's been great meeting you all. Um, I'm one of those, I'm too busy to read a book. Uh, I always find other things to do. So it's been great meeting all of you to encourage me to read this. Awesome, awesome. Crystal. Yes, thanks everyone. I really appreciated hearing all of the perspectives and especially uh, Kasha. Really appreciated your perspective tonight. And um, one thing that always stands out to me is that, you know, after all of this, it's the, the white colonizers, the Canadian government that is massively underestimating the indigenous people and and um, to some point it seems uh, ludicrous and ridiculous that uh, they do in such a way it's it is like people mentioned evil but at the same time um, like look at all of what's being done and the resurgence in languages and cultures and you know moving forward with things despite all of this so that's the hope that I always focus on after all of this other stuff that moving forward and hopefully more white allies will come forward as well. Awesome. Thanks, Crystal. Kasha, would you like to chime in? 
Oh, I, I just want to say thank you, and I'm really glad that I came out tonight. Oh, me too. I think we really appreciated having more uh, Indigenous perspective. It's just always great to hear other um, like-minded people and, you know, sharing um, perspective of, of where, where you come from. And um, it just has a big impact on me and on, definitely on, on others. So, um, yeah. And yeah, I, and just the whole, the, the way you have the, the, the format is um, kind of neat. <laughs> kind of really, it, yeah, blows me away. But, um, yeah. uh, you know, I appreciate nice that. To nice to see allies and, yeah. And maybe even some accomplices here, too. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Um, when we had our Two-Spirit, uh, well, we had Joshua Whitehead's book. We um, allowed those who were LGBTQ2 plus to speak first. Um, so me as a straight cis tried to take a back seat. And there was two gay men who were white, but I still gave them the space because obviously the subject matter, their opinion mattered a lot. So, you know, it kind of went indigenous first, LGBTQ2 plus first, and then, you know, myself as someone who was straight and cis. <sighs> yeah, you know, I, I just think that's the way you're supposed to prioritize the voice, depending on the subject. So, um, yeah, so thank you again. And I hope you come back and tell your friends, please don't hesitate to, uh, encourage like-minded people to come to this because we need to support each other as uh, Kat is doing with her Settler Book Club as well. Uh, Sarah, would you like to chime in as with some lasting thoughts? Yeah, just uh, thank you again, Michelle and everybody. As always, I learned a ton. And I'm excited to read my third pass through this book. I'm sure there will be a third and many more and just apply and uh, read it from the lens of some of the perspectives I gained tonight. So thank you all. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. And Jacqueline, would you like to chime in with some lasting thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to echo the thanks to both Michelle and also to Kasha. Um, the stories, I love stories. I love learning through stories. So it's deeply, deeply appreciated. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just... I've said it before, I'll just say again, I'm just really loving this club and feeling bolstered in my efforts to be a, a co-conspirator. So, yeah. <laughs> right on. Well, thank you all for coming. And again, our, our next section are the calls to action for, um, Jesus, it's 71 to 74, I think, are the actual numbers. No, it's 70, 76. So 71 to 76 and that book. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll be busy next time as well. And hopefully it'll be recorded for everybody to see if they've missed us. And, and that's the other thing. If you think that somebody could benefit from just um, listening to our book club, um, obviously I'm going to give it to Bob Joseph and uh, yeah, maybe we can go from there because you know what? I want to arm you to tell others um, when you see, harmful remarks and such of, you know, possible solutions. So yeah, thanks everybody for coming until next, next month. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everybody. Keep well. Yes, take care. Stay healthy. You too. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Just us. <laughs> I'm still figuring out my new computer. <laughs> yeah, totally fair. Right on. Okay, well, take care, Roberta. Thanks Thank again for coming back. Thank you, Michelle. Take care. You too.